Interviews with the best in their fields, teaching you how to excel in careers that don't require traditional college. You're listening to the College Alternative Podcast. Insider tips and advice, straight from the experts. And now, here is your host, James Christian. Hey, thanks for tuning in, guys. Very excited. We're up to episode five now. So today we've got Rory May on. He works at Dragon Forge, based out of Pine, Colorado. He's a blacksmith, a longtime blacksmith, and he also publishes a great YouTube series called Dirty Smith, where he does tutorials for guys that want to become blacksmiths. He talks all about how to forge various objects, and uh, he's done a great job. He's very, very humorous, and so today he's going to be talking about how to become a blacksmith, how, how, uh, what courses to take. Um, and how to get hired on at a blacksmithing shop. So tune in and enjoy, guys. Thanks. Hello and welcome to the College Alternative Podcast, the podcast that shows you how to excel in careers that don't require traditional college. So today I have with me Rory May. He is co-owner, I believe, of Dragon Forge <laughs> at DirtySmith.com. Uh, and he's uh, been a blacksmith for how many years? Well, I'm 34, so about 38 years. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, no, really, uh, I have some serious uh, history for about 20 years. Okay, okay. As long as as soon as you could swing a hammer, you could, huh? Pretty much. Being <laughs> a, it being a family business and also a, a form of punishment, I was involved in the shop from a young age. Oh, nice. Nothing better than to instill uh, somebody with a passion than to uh, make it a make it a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, where are you based out of? Dragon Forge is based out of Pine, Colorado. Okay. About a forty-five minutes southwest of Denver. Okay. Okay. All right. And uh, you've been how long has it been around for? Um, a little, a little back. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little background on Dragon Forge. Craig started out as a farrier shoeing horses. Okay. And I believe late seventies, early eighties, he started Dragon Forge shoeing horses and um, had established quite the clientele in New Mexico. And the blacksmithing association invited the horseshoeing association to a conference. And as he puts it, he walked in to the conference thinking he was a blacksmith and realized he wasn't. Oh, and interesting. Okay. After that exposure, he started to practice what he was seeing and going to conferences and demonstrations. Meanwhile, still shoeing horses in the full time. And then he, he said in the winter times, business would slow down. And so he would get some other jobs working for some local blacksmiths. And from there was networking and meeting smiths and getting some experience. I was born in 82 and Dragon Forge's big break happened, I believe in 88, maybe 87. But Craig landed a huge job called the Lodge of Cordillera, which is located up by Vail. I believe it's in Edwards, but by Vail, Colorado. Okay. And this is like a gated community they have their own private golf course they have their own private ski slopes so for a blacksmith for a high-end architectural shop this is like that dream job where you have multiple clientele that are just waiting to to hear about you and he got the whole lodge so he said he had two years worth of work off the bat and that's really what put him on the map and then from there it just kind of snowballed exactly from there there, people, architects, um, clientele, and interior designers. I I kind of came into the picture as a young kid, being that my mom had an office job and I hated babysitters. And dad said, you know what? If you're at the shop, you have to stay out of trouble. You got to stay out of the way. I can set you up with a little forge and hammer. But I was like six. I mean, <laughs> I would love to say, yeah, I was making railings at six. I wasn't. I was burning myself and running around outside in the mountains and stuff. And then um, as I got older, I was getting more interested in it, but there was also the physical part of it, the size of being big enough to handle the equipment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> what was it about? It was about eight or ten dad started to introduce um, welders and grinders and oxyacetylene torch. 
And so I was cutting things and I could put things together. And then about 12, he said, you know, let's make something. Let's, let's forge a project. And the concept of thinking backwards when you're making a project and being able to replicate it mm-hmm. by deconstructing it. So we did all that and wrote all the steps down. And he's like, okay, you have this project to make, which was a fire tool set. I had a poker, a, a broom, and a shovel, and little holders. And it took me all summer to make and did everything. He helped me with some of the forge welding, some of the harder technical stuff. And we got done with it. And he's like, you know, critiqued me on it, did a good job. And what do you think about this, Rory? How much, if you were going to sell it, how much would you sell it for? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 12. I'm like, $300. <laughs> And little did I know, he had money in his pocket, and he agreed and gave me $300, and I had sold my first forged item. And at that time, I was the richest 12-year-old I knew. Oh, man. And nowadays, like, at 20s and 30s, you're like, uh, how much should I sell this for? <laughs> you know, that, yeah. As opposed to a 12-year-old, hey, let me just throw a number out there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. he's a joker. Zeros are free. $100, $1,000, 10000 Oh. And then uh, skip forward a little bit, turned 15, had a friend in out of town. We were 15-year-old punks getting into trouble. I mean, doing all the stuff you're not supposed to do. And we found a dump truck. And okay. it's kind of, a, kind of a long story, but we found a dump truck in this new establishment that was going to be a junkyard. So nobody's working that day. We trespass. We go down to the, the dump truck, and my friend's like, I, w- I want to drive this dump truck. Oh. All right. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do this. So we get in the dump truck. We drive it around some circles. In the process, we run over a shed. <laughs> and the shed was the office for this place. <laughs> and what do we do? We just go right, right home. 8 o'clock that night, the cops knock on the door. Come with us, kids. You're in trouble. So uh, mom and dad were home. You know, and then you have to kind of face the music. And Craig said exactly that. You need to make this right. And anything we have to pay up front, I need you to pay me back. And trying to get a job as a 15-year-old is kind of hard. So I ended up Mm -hmm. actually working at the shop. And at the time, the shop had six guys working in it. I was low man on the totem pole. And anything that needed to be ground or cut, any kind of grunt work, it was me doing it. And then get a car and a little bit more debt. And I didn't, I didn't get that paid off until I was about 18, 19 years old. And also working with Craig, I, you know, he's starting me off at minimum wage and slowly started to, to work that up. Yeah. But little did I know because of that incident and all that happened, I actually started the groundwork for what I needed to learn in the process of going into the blacksmithing direction. Yeah, I mean, that sounds actually really cool, though, in, in, in retrospect. I mean, you started yeah. when you were six years old. I mean, in, in a trade, how many how many kids have the ability to say that they, you know, learned actual skill at that age, you know, and were able to perfect it, and they had all that equipment in their, in their backyard, essentially, yeah. to practice? Well, in my perspective, I, was, you know, I thought everyone's dad had a shop. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> Especially Metal nowadays, or, no. But, Exactly. So as as I got older and realizing that this is even more unique and more rare, kind of really stood out even more. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, though, that you were able to take advantage of it. You know. Uh, so how how have you guys been able to set yourself apart? And I know you guys got that big break, but uh, how have you tried to position your company and set set yourselves apart from every other blacksmith out there? What what are you guys doing to be able to do that? Man, you know, a really big part of it is doing what you say you're going to do. There's a lot of shops that that will not take advantage of the opportunity and take advantage of the client, and then it hurts the reputation, and it also kind of hurts the reputation of being a blacksmith or a metal worker in that the client might be a little bit bitter. So we always follow through. It's 150% make sure it's great, it's on time, it looks good, and it's consistency. Whatever we produce, it's always at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you can always overproduce and overachieve something for the client, that that client's going to be, you know, over the moon. I I think that's huge, too. And a lot of people nowadays, a lot of people are just talk. 
You know, totally. a lot of you know, a lot of people don't follow through with a lot, a lot of different stuff. It's not just their business, which is surprising. Yeah, exactly. And that and that was always the big thing is that we wanted a a good reputation to precede us. And it, it always seems that the bad news travels oh, faster yeah. and harder than the good news. So if we keep that constant good work, good foot, professional attitude, nobody has anything to say bad about us other than we make quality stuff. And um, the other flip side of that is that it's not cheap. The stuff mm -hmm. is expensive. Mm -hmm. And we, we really appeal to a really high-end uh, clientele that has the kind of money to invest back into their house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, with with everybody nowadays being able to get online and Yelp and YouTube and I mean, it just takes one quick video, you know, showing a shoddy product exactly. to, to wreck a company, really, you exactly. know, or one bad review of a restaurant. So that's yeah, that's huge, man. That's huge. So quality control is big for you guys. Exactly. And and also I started noticing with Dragon Forge and all the energy going into it, which is great because we're building the company, my age being late 20s to now 34 was working against me in the craft because there's almost a stereotype that you really? need to be this older guy with some gray in the face and the hair to establish this blacksmith look. Huh. So with the blacksmithing trend that's kind of coming up online on television, I was kind of, kind of hungry to start a second entity, and that's Dirty Smith, and start demonstrating my skills in the production mode for people who are not only interested, but also to demonstrate who I am kind of outside of Dragon Forge. Okay. Okay. So that's why you, you started that instructional or tutorial videos on YouTube, huh? Exactly. Because I was seeing a lot of backyard smiths who were attempting to do what they could try to do, but the technique was a little flawed. The theory was a little off and it was just... And if I showed them this, I can I can get them on the right path, and they can take off from it. And then at that point, it was like, well, why don't I start doing YouTube tutorials? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, make them free, easy to follow, a little bit of fun, a little bit of humor to keep them entertained, and see where it goes. And I actually am very surprised how how large it's going and where it's going from here. Oh yeah, you've got what like close to fifteen thousand subscribers right now? Yeah, fifteen thousand subscribers. Got about almost uh, thirty thousand on Instagram. 8,000 on Facebook. Twitter's a little, I'm still figuring out Twitter. I oh, think I'm man. almost at 1,000 on Twitter. <laughs> but uh, the numbers are there, and the personalities and the people and the feedback is always good. It's always consistent. And I love it when, when someone follows a tutorial and they send me a picture like, hey, I did it. Thanks. This is awesome. <laughs> it's, it's, there's no, nothing can, uh, can equal that kind of satisfaction just seeing somebody like actually follow what you showed them and had never had met them. Yeah, I was reading the other day this book, uh, Hundred Dollar Startup. I don't know if you've read that one or not. I've I've heard about that. Oh, okay. In there, they they describe uh, sort of a technique, I guess you could say, where it's a strategic generosity. You know, and I guess that would fit you what you're doing to a T. You know, you're strategically being generous with your time and your skills, and it's paying off. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's paying off in, in clientele and and notoriety, right? On on the scale of the clientele for Dirty Smith is much different than the clientele for Dragon Forge. Mm. With Dragon Forge, it is the one percent guys. Mm -hmm. It is the CEOs of the big the big companies we see every day. And with with inside Dirty Smith, it's a totally different crowd, totally different group of people appealing there and it's also kind of a backup if someone does search me or my name that's in that clientele then they're going to have all these youtube videos of like mm -hmm. oh here here he is actually forging wow i haven't heard of any feedback yet from the clientele of dragon forge about it but at the same time keeping that good foot forward and that presentation forward i'm not very concerned if they do find me yeah well i mean it's definitely gonna it's, it's coming down the pipe i mean youtube yeah. is what the second largest search engine out there Exactly. So, I mean, I'm going to do my research if I'm going to invest in, you know, a couple hundred or a couple grand worth of uh, art. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's totally, yeah, true. Um, so being a blacksmith, um, a lot of people think, and you've corrected it, but a lot of people think a blacksmith is just, you know, let's throw some horseshoes on or... You know, I don't know even today, you know, you see Tumblr pictures of making hammers and everything like that. But so 
what what is a blacksmith in today's I guess modern world? What do you guys do? That that is a very yeah you know, was a very important question because the term blacksmith is very broad. It's like a chef, someone mm -hmm. who says they're a chef, and you're thinking flames from the pan and shrimp and potatoes and all this good stuff, but yeah. they actually work at McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. It's like I make burgers. Well, yeah, you're a chef, but you work at fast food joints. So it's a little bit different. So inside of blacksmithing, we have everything from farriers and they manipulate metal. They forge the uh, horseshoes and th that's a whole other science when you're, when you are applying that kind of stuff to animals that mm -hmm. are moving and their health depends on kick. it. They can kick they really hard. <laughs> kick and bite. Uh, I, I, we grew up with horses. I was more worried about them biting me rather than <laughs> kicking me. But And then you have uh, jewelry, so a lot smaller mm. scale work, okay. and a lot of precious metals, maybe a little bit of non-ferrous metals. And then we have uh, things inside of that, silversmithing and soldering and whatnot. And then you have the blacksmithing, which can range anywhere from the high-end architectural ironwork to making little beer bottle openers at a festival to abstract art for front yards to kinetic moving art. I've seen some smiths That's get cool. really, really large projects in like private golf industries. And um, then the other tier of like weapons, knives, swords, axes, and that's a whole other metallurgy is very important inside of that presentation and history of and the function of the weapon, not just mm -hmm. that it looks cool, but it has a purpose as well. So really with blacksmithing, it is so broad, it's so grand. If you have the basic tools, you have an anvil, you got the forge, you have a hammer, you have the material, you could go in any of those directions. Mm -hmm. It's so just you can pursue what, whatever passion you really want. Exactly. What's your intent? And then from there, where do you want to go with that intent? And really, it'll take you as far as you want to go. You just have to put the work in. Oh, that's kind of cool. Because I never really, I never even thought about jewelry, for one. I never really thought about these massive art projects that are out there and include mm -hmm. that within the category of blacksmithing. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I was, again, just, you know, a guy on an anvil hammering, you know, something out and I don't know, trying to sell it. I, I didn't know that there were specific categories and that's, that is really, really neat. And the, the other thing too, is that with the metalworking is that we're kind of always on the edge of the technology. So hmm. some, some people will say, you know, you have a power hammer, which is this big machine and it has a big, uh, die on it and you press on this pedal and this die goes up and down you can put large material in there and you can forge three inch square bar quite easily because this machine is pounding it for you mm -hmm. and have been criticized like well you use a power hammer that's that's not traditional well they had water power power hammers a thousand years ago in china yeah. i mean those tools have been around so like right now we have induction forges where they don't use any heat source it's all done with electricity and oh, wow that's cool it's really neat, really yeah, cool stuff. Awesome. So being on the edge of that technology and using the concepts of what has been going on for the past 3,000 years in the blacksmithing world and applying it to new technology and being able to manipulate that bar even more and get where your intent is again to uh, that final project that you want to produce. And, and who wants to really break their back? Trying to forge three inch square. Seat. Exactly. There are those guys that enjoy it, and at that point, I would uh, tip my hat to them and watch them work and <laughs> go turn on the power hammer. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no disrespect at all to any of the guys that do forge big iron by hand. It is a oh, definitely man. a personality and a body type that that does it well. Yeah, their forearms must be massive. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so what's a typical day look like for you then? Um, you wake up in the morning, you get breakfast, you go to the shop. What are you typically doing? So a lot of it depends on where we are in the project. I might be spending the, the, the first part of the day going over drawings or layouts or maybe talking to a contractor about what are we making and how are we doing it. Maybe talking to the client and making sure they like where we're going and they understand what they're, what they're working with and what they're buying. Uh, if I'm at the actual studio, because we have other employees there as well as Craig working Dragon Forge, make sure everybody is on track. Is there any questions? Is there any problems with equipment? Does anything need to be fixed? If, if that is all okay, then I can go to 
my side of the shop and I have a, my own kind of personal studio inside of the big studio of Dragon Forge. And then from there, um, man, whatever needs to, to get done. Right now I'm working on a chandelier, so I'm, I'm forging the frames, I'm forging the arms, I'm making sure my layout's right and staging myself to – so staging myself so I can work all day and I don't get tired by 2 o'clock and I'm, mm. I'm too exhausted. Uh, typically work until 5 or 6, depends on the job. There's been uh, plenty of times worked 15-hour days for two weeks to hit the deadline to make sure the client was going to – be expecting what they were wanting when they were wanting it and on top of that then we have dirty smith which i do after hours so i'm at the shop alone i close the doors lock the doors no one can come in and i set up the camera and i already have an idea what i want to do and i might forge for another two or three hours and then come home yeah. and edit and you know all the dish stuff takes a long time too people people forget how how uh, or they don't know how long it takes to film something <laughs> exactly and then the post-production of editing oh, and man. audio and it just it just adds to it but i i i went to college for media arts thinking i wanted to do something else and when i got done with it i was like man i i, I have a hard time just being in front of the computer and mm -hmm. my body was doing weird things and computers were crashing because we're using big programs and at the time we, we were hearing about the recession coming mm -hmm. and i sat down with craig and i said Man, the news, everybody's saying this, this recession's coming. With what I knew, with what I went to school, I said, while the lights are off, as a metaphor is economically, while the lights are off and nobody's paying attention, it's like, let's rebrand Dragon Forge. Let's mm. clear the slate. I'll do the photography. I'll do the website. I'll do the social media. And let's just start all over. That way, when the lights come back on, we're looking really good. And we, we, we I'm going to say this. In the simplest terms, it worked. About two years ago, we had Mike Rowe call the show, call the shop, and we were, ended up being featured on a show called Somebody's Got to Do It. And from there, just the social media and the engagement and the clientele, um, all that work paid off <laughs> in the long run. Okay. Well, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about prior is your morning it kind of consists of uh communicating with the client and making sure that client is happy with what you're planning on doing exactly yeah um so are you seeing any growing trends to blacksmithing i know with social media out there a lot of people are getting more and more interested in art are you seeing an increase in sales or people getting into blacksmithing i'm seeing a big trend on the entertainment side with the television shows that are coming up and also just the feedback on the social media side of people. I, I'm not sure if they're seeing the shows. I'm not sure where the interest is coming from exactly. But they're, the good thing is that they're finding me. And we have a platform that they can approach me and ask questions. And I can give them honest, professional perspective back to what they're wondering about. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's just, it, I don't know if you're seeing it or not. But I'm kind of seeing it's almost like a... People are getting more and more interested in, in uh, as as the world's accelerating and technology is getting faster and faster and faster. It almost seems like people are wanting to uh, reconnect, I guess, with with old ways. I well, guess you could say, right? And and complementing that, because the technology and the communication is speeding up, it's it's easy for me to set up a camera and run a live mm. stream off YouTube and like. Here you go. Yeah. You know, ten years ago we couldn't do that. It was burning DVDs and mailing people VHSs. But now it's such such a a great time and being on this leading edge with the communication that it maybe because it's easier to share. There's yeah. more interest for it. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'm I'm seeing like people. A lot of my friends are getting into brewing beer nowadays. A lot of them are, you know. Uh, dry curing sausages and, and uh, welding. You got, and You got some nice friends. I, now we're I know. It. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to learn from them. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's what I'm seeing out there. But a lot, I don't know, blacksmithing, I haven't, I haven't found any friends yet in this area that have done that yet. But uh, yeah. I'm searching. Um, we can forge from sausage pokers. <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> um, okay, so it sounds like you kind of um, – I wouldn't say lucked into being a blacksmith, but it, it was almost like you were groomed or 
you uh it, it's you you were able to start out at a young age with with blacksmithing my perspective is that it always has felt that the situation that i literally was born into that blacksmithing chose me mm, okay and when i stepped out of that and i saw what other options i had i came back mm, okay okay because you liked it so much, it was a passion of yours. Exactly. I was. I went to a, a commercial arts college, and they wanted us to do projects, and they're the the concept of three D. So they're thinking cardboard and pipe cleaners, and I walk in with a twenty pound metal sculpture, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh wow!" And they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. And that's when they first started to see that I I was this round peg in a square hole. That's awesome. And so is that what you are trying to drift towards? now is more the art side of the house versus more of the i guess the practical is that what you're what you truly have a passion for is the is the artwork um the what we do and how we do it is kind of an art form in itself it's obviously more functional because it's architectural ironwork so it's lighting and railings and fireplace doors but the design that goes into that and the techniques we're using as far as you know forging material and the twists we're doing and processes of instead of just drilling a hole we we will actually sh slit with a tool and then put the shape of the hole through that slit oh, to make it wow. something different that you know a machinist would have a hard time replicating or reproducing and that that is what I really enjoy is just the straight manipulation of material I don't care if it's an art piece I don't care if it's a railing I love the process Hmm. That's okay. Okay. I could see that I, all things are art then when you, when you make it like that, that's okay. That's cool. Hey, so when you, when you, uh, reset during the recession and you retooled your shop and your, your, your look and everything and your brand, um, what influenced you in developing a brand? How, what, what is your brand and, and how did you develop it? how did you decide on it? I, was fresh out of college for the commercial arts and was was still kind of in that college mode because college was very intense going to class and then homework at home kind of similar schedule at the shop as far as you had your full-time uh, responsibilities and then after work you still had work to do so I was I was still programmed to be working long days that way and the direction I saw Dragon Forge going was a very tacky stereotype. The web designer had these like really poorly animated flames around the whole perimeter of the website and it was just really tacky and I grabbed a a, a high-end magazine. I think it was I think it was called Lux. But anyways, there's there's high-end architectural magazines. I grabbed one of them and I sat down with Craig and I said, "Look at these guys. Look at how they're presenting our, themselves. We need to be comparable to that. If not, we need to be even better." And mm -hmm. kind of followed what the competition was doing and brainstorming, "How can I one up this or how can I do what they're doing but a little bit di different because they're starting to still look a little dated, a little old, I and mean, having that fresh presentation of, a, of an old technique that we can still be appealing and applicable to these modern homes coming up. And how to set yourself apart from your competition. That's, exactly. That is huge. So I guess the advice would be look at what your market, what you're trying to market to. Yeah. You want to you look at the clientele. Who are you marketing to? I had a, a gentleman, he was getting ready to go getting ready to do a show and he was very excited and he he thought that if I just make anything it'll sell mm -hmm. and I had the same perspective once I, I, I participated in some downtown Denver has a very small underground art scene which is almost kind of a joke because it's a bunch of poor college kids who want to drink and other poor <laughs> college kids making art and nobody has any money, so it's kind of hard to sell stuff. And I thought, what would be a universal object everybody could enjoy? And I thought it was a bowl, a vessel, a forged little piece of art you could put on a table. And ended up not doing very well because, one, the, the budget wasn't there for the crowd, and there was no real appeal. So was like, my advice to this guy who wanted to make a lot of stuff was like, well, who are you going to be talking to? Are we talking to rich people who are looking to buy art? Or are we look talking to people who are drinking beer and want a bottle opener? Mm -hmm. And appeal to that clientele so that you have some confidence that they're going to be excited to see you and you have something to talk about and share. 
Yeah, totally two different markets and and they're going to want different things completely. Yeah. Exactly. I, everybody wants a bottle opener though, you know, but, uh, <laughs> or a sausage poker or a sausage poker. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, talking about marketing techniques a little bit more here, uh, almost more importantly, because you're getting on Tumblr and all this other stuff and you're investing a lot of time and energy in, into that. Um, uh, almost more importantly is what has been, a, what have you found has been a waste of time and money in terms of marketing? What has been a dead end, any dead ends for you in terms of, uh, trying to seek new clientele. Has there been anything or has it been mostly all successful? We, I've been on like local news stations a couple times and we really thought, I really thought when the micro show showed up, I was, I was like, this is it. We're going to be prime time mm. CNN in front of, I would assume people well off paying attention to CNN because it's tied with the money market. It's tied with the global events and stuff like that. I was like, man, we are in front of the right crowd. And we went, we went over the top of what are we going to make? So that was a whole discussion. It's like, mm -hmm. we're just not going to make a bottle opener for Mike Rowe, hoping these people watching CNN want railings and what we make. So it's like, let's make a business sign for him. We'll know he'll love it. We'll do a good job. We'll have all the confidence that it'll be fine and maybe get some attention that way and i i made contact lists for interior designers i want to work with with architects i want to work with mailed out emailed social media i i shook every tree i could i contacted newspapers i contacted uh the local news stations and had everything set up at go and the show airs website got some traffic we got some phone calls and we got one railing out of Kansas and that was it. <laughs> wow. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. Interesting. Interesting. I was really surprised how, how really poorly, and don't get me wrong, it was a great experience and the show itself oh, yeah, sure. is awesome, but I, I really thought that I was going to get a little bit more of that acknowledgement and that who we are and what we do being presented with a personality such as Mr. Rowe, that it would have given some people some integrity and curiosity. I take it back. We got more phone calls about people wanted that sign, but <laughs> we, we couldn't reproduce that sign and um, was really disappointed that it was going to be a lot more. That, that's probably the biggest one. Advertising in magazines has always been good. It might be even be a couple years later after a magazine ad where a client had cut our ad out and had a folder and was waiting for that moment to call us. Okay. Online advertising has always gone well uh, because of Dirty Smith and Dirty Smith is tied to Dragon Forge and I was putting Dirty Smith in places that I wasn't really seeing in social media that that seemed to help out as far as search engine results if someone put in my name or Dragon Forge's name we there was more content there for them to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as far as like marketing wise, the television has been the hardest one to get any reward out of, but everything else eventually, eventually paid off. Even if it took yeah. a couple of years, it, it, it did pay off. And I'm sure it was kind of a little, probably a little disappointing, you know, I, I'm sure. It was very disappointing. Yeah. But I, and I, I had called the other people that I saw that were on television and interviewed them like what would be some good advice this is what i'm doing blah 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 and they're like yeah you're right on track you know good luck to you and yeah yeah well but i think to all the listeners out there i think sometimes you're just going to hit those snags sometimes yeah. it's just not going to work for you you know exactly and at the same time though because i i did so much work it was it was a good exercise about what it really takes to promote a company like that. Cause I'm still working for dragon forge and I'm still doing dirty Smith stuff, but it, if I didn't go that far, I would always wonder what if I had done contacted all those interior designers? What if I had contacted those architects, but because I covered all my bases, I, I had a really good heartbeat of, of what the feedback was. Yeah. There's no doubt left in your mind that you didn't, uh, I, yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. And I know I, I tried everything and I, and I, I really, really overthought and try to cover my bases and I'm glad I did. Cause I, I could see what the results were right there. Yeah. Yeah. But that again, just goes to show, you know, work and, you know, and, and integrity and mm -hmm. uh, quality, you know, going that extra mile 
you know, and just making that a part of your, your daily technique. So yeah, yeah habits. Um, okay. So switching it up here a little bit, um, for a guy that's starting out for, for something like this, let's say he wants to try to do this. Um, how much space are you going to initially need for a blacksmithing shop? I would I would back up one more before we go to the shop. Oh, go for it. Go for and it. And I, I would say take a class. Yes. Make sure you like it because yes. you might not like it. <laughs> you might think, this is ridiculous. I'm going fishing. <laughs> and we've had people take classes and not finish the class because they're like, this is too hard. Oh, wow. Um, they dropped out? Yeah, I'm done. It's a three-day oh, class. And two and a half <laughs> days in it. They're like, I'm going home. Have fun. Bye. Keep my money. <laughs> well, so, okay. We, we can go there first. Okay. So... As far as training is concerned, okay, so um, you you guys produce a course out there. Uh, I was perusing your shop. Uh, what is it? How long is it? And what do you guys cover? Typically, we have a three-day intro to blacksmithing class. And inside of that, we forge a fire poker. And that fire poker can consists of how to forge a taper, how to do a forge weld, a variety of twists, a variety of hooks, a variety of eyes. And inside of those three days, by the end of the third day, hopefully you have a fire poker, including all those. Some people do, and they have a simple version. Some people have that, and they have five other things because they, they soaked it up really well. And we also do a power hammer class on how to forge with a power hammer and how to use it efficiently. And we also have a tools to make tools class where you start with one tool and that tool makes tool number two and then that tool makes tool number three, et cetera. And I think it's like seven or eight tools all together. Oh, wow. And each, each tool does something differently and they all complement each other. And it's, it's a really good also uh, different way of thinking instead of just you're going out and buying this tool. It's like, well, I'm manipulating the steel here and I got to go stage one, two, three, four to get to that tool over here. Okay. And that, that sounds like my, my welding buddies. <laughs> yeah. Like, Oh, uh, I'm just going to make that for you. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go out and buy it, but, uh, you know, that's even better. Um, so if you take those three classes that you guys offer, is that a good, good foundation for someone? It's a really good introduction. From there, the next step I would recommend is that you join some kind of group. If it's a local state group, it's the big national group, be part of that, that culture. There's also plenty of Facebook pages. Uh, Dirty Smith has a forum called Blacksmiths Online and a Facebook page as well where we I might have a contest, like we're going to have a zombie apocalypse weapon contest coming up soon, <laughs> which is always fun. But you can be part of some little bit of culture inside of that and start networking, start talking, start looking at what other people are forging and stuff. Okay. And do a lot of shops out there, Do let's say you don't want to get employed, uh, do a lot of shops, uh, do apprenticeships then? Or how, how do I become an employee of a blacksmithing shop? Apprenticeship inside of the blacksmithing world kind of has a bad taste in its mouth when someone says, oh. I wanted to be an apprentice because that an employer could hear, I want you to pay me to learn. Hmm. So okay. if, you're, if you're going to approach a shop and you're interested in blacksmithing, I really would make an effort to sh be able to show that employer, this is something I made. If it's a fire poker, if it's whatever it is, it's it's a hundred bottle openers, and that shows right away that you have some intent on doing it. Even, man, even if it was a sketchbook full of ideas of things that you wanted to make, not necessarily like I'm going to make this stuff. It's like I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I want to take the next step. What what will it take for me to work here? And that employer might say, take some classes. That employer might say, start Monday, and you're going to start doing all the grunt work in the shop and each one might be a little different. So I, I would approach it on, on that one that you're hungry to learn this. And I, I, my personal opinion is I would not say the word apprentice. Okay. That's kind of interesting because, you know, like uh, a lot of other different trades out there, like tattoo artists or they'll all, they'll all go through a certain, each shop will have a certain amount of time that they'll almost develop their, their guys. So you're saying don't use the word apprentice. Don't, don't approach it from that perspective. Exactly. Because we, in the States, we don't have a traditional apprenticeship formula to, to set up like the UK does. 
they have a great setup on guys that can go to colleges, do an apprenticeship, and then do the journeyman level where they travel to different shops for a very mm -hmm. amount of time and kind of hit these check marks, these milestones in their career and doing it. On the U.S. side, you're going to have to build it yourself and build your experience and your education. And that means paying attention to who you work for, what do they make, and where do you want to go with that. That almost sounds really cool, though. The U.K. seems to have... Would that be a better system, do you think, than the U.S.? Or I'm envious of the U.K.'s blacksmithing system. I wish that was established here, and it's not really. Um, the national group, Abana, has a journeyman certification program kind of going on, but it's very loose, and it's not, very, it's not pushed very hard. Hmm. Okay. So it's not I – don't, so there's an association here, but as far as the U.K., there's a certain set standards almost. And yeah, they're almost more enforced. A, they're a lot more enforced and respected and, and mm. known about. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe maybe as blacksmithing gets more and more popular, maybe would it go that you see it maybe going that route or no? you know, Dirty Smith could have an apprenticeship yeah. program and people could jump on board and get a free <laughs> shirt and say, "Hey, I took some Dirty Smith courses. Hire me." <laughs> nice. Okay. So, um, how long does it take to become a good blacksmith? And I know that's a that's a moving, moving standard. You know, the better you get, the more you you know you need to learn. But exactly, that's. Let's see. I have a good. Con I can say confidently, twenty years behind me working alongside my father inside a Dragon Forge. I probably wasn't as confident as I am now, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of that is not only just building and, and being efficient and clean, but uh, the business side of it, talking to clients and talking to employees and being able to wear those different hats in that kind of situation. As far as building and forging goes, I would hate to say this this is the magic number, but it, it could be five years. Some people really picked us up really fast. It could be 10 years. And it also depends, too, on the perspective of, who is saying you're good or and not? I've seen smiths that have very rough work compared to what we do in Dragon Forge. It's it's not as accurate, it's not as clean, but they can sell it, and yeah. they do well because they can sell it. Yeah, and their business is probably good because of that. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, that's what sales drives business. You know, at the end of the day, so that's true. Um, and as far as as blacksmithing is concerned, you can make a living being a blacksmith. Yes, it doesn't just have to be a, a hobby for people out there. They can, they can take that leap and and make it a career, right? Exactly. With the example of Dragon Forge, Craig was networking well enough with the right amount of people that when the Lodge of Cordillera came up, another smith actually gave that to Craig. Said, "I don't want this. Here you go." What? So. Really, it, it was it was a really really great and I don't know I don't want to say rare opportunity, but he he was doing everything right. He was networking. He was talking to other smiths. It, it's not always a competition and uh, having an attitude like I'm the only blacksmith around. It's better if you have the approachable personality of Hey, can I can I work part time and collaborate? Because while you're working in that shop, something might come through that you can benefit from that you didn't know was going to be there. Well, that that's awesome. That's very generous, and it's pretty impressive that he was in a, well, good that he was in a position to be able to take advantage of that. Exactly. So making a career, yes, um, I would just really advise that you have to have the attitude that I am going to do this if that means I'm working for another blacksmith for 10 years or if that means I'm doing public demonstrations wherever I can and networking and talking and sharing and getting people to stop and look at what you're doing it's a lot of work, but the, re the reward is there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as far as the business side of the house, what are some of the costs expenses that uh, people don't really, wouldn't really expect or realize or, or know about <clears throat> probably time is one of them in the networking. Yeah. Time buying the equipment. Cause there's always the better tool. There's always, having more than one whatever um, tongs and hammers the type type of work that you're doing you know we we use power hammers quite a bit so we have a lot of power hammer tools 
on top of we do a lot of traditional joinery so we have a lot of hand tools to make those joints and mortise and tendons and whatnot so tooling up is is probably underestimated you can't get far with just a hammer and an anvil that always had the attitude of you know I'm doing I'm making bottle openers right now because one I can make a bottle opener too I know people will buy that I'm gonna take those funds and reinvest into myself so I can buy that power hammer I can buy that that other tong set that I really need right now so I can go over here and keep growing and keep progressing forward so it's always an evolution materials are typically pretty cheap if you go to a steel yard there might be a a rim pile which is sold at a scrap price instead of buying new material and um, what else then you have the 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 paperwork side of it you got taxes you have insurances you have mm -hmm. audits when you start reaching that that kind of level that people usually don't think about <laughs> all that fun stuff yeah <laughs> so it sounds like my previous question about like space and everything like that for blacksmithing is almost maybe oh. the wrong question to ask because it seems like really you need to invest some time initially maybe possibly work for somebody else for a little while and see really if, if you want to do this full time exactly um I've seen some guys have a little sh a little shed in their backyard and it's a 8 foot by 8 foot shed. It's tiny, but they're forging, they're producing. Mm -hmm. in inside of Dragon Forge, we have a 5000 square foot floor plan and I have a about a 1000 square foot part of that and I'm I'm now starting to outgrow that 1000 square foot part so I'm yeah, that's pretty cool though that's, that's it cool. is at the same time it's like man I need another 1000 feet <laughs> I joke with Craig about that I need your side of the shop give me your side and you go back home but let's build uh, another addition <laughs> exactly so then you're managing your materials and and being a little bit more efficient as well which is good because the more efficient you are inside your shop the quicker you can work at so having dedicated stations, keeping a clean work area of that sort. So we've been talking about the, the seeming that uh, blacksmithing is, is growing, at least a little bit more people might have a, start having an interest in this. Um, do you think that uh, if there's an increase in saturation in terms of blacksmiths out there, is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Because you were talking earlier about networking with all these other guys and possibly having it more out there for the public to see mm -hmm. is more blacksmiths going to be good for the business or 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 is it going to increase competition for you personally i i would love to see more blacksmiths more blacksmithing and in that it's more of a common thing in our culture just on the basis of you know, there's going to be more equipment there's going to be more conferences. There's going to be more techniques. You have more people doing the same thing, finding out how to do things differently. So education-wise, it's great because more people are doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, Competition-wise, that's when you start getting into the tier of the clientele. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I am personally, I'm not too concerned. <clears throat> Excuse me. Personally, I'm not too concerned if someone is a backyard blacksmith and they're making yard art and we're trying to appeal to that one percent clientele that has those big jobs that we want i kind of keep them in mind because if we're hiring i might call them and say hey you want a job because you're already forging and stuff and help me get where i want to go mm -hmm. and it's going to help you so I, I guess to answer your question no i'm not not that concerned about the competition hmm. okay and also I, I i would almost invite it Oh, that's cool. So you're thinking that there's definitely room for more blacksmiths out there for people that exactly. are interested. They should get into it. And exactly. What okay. what where it gets gray is the fabrication side of the metalworking, where we have fabricators who are welders and do beautiful stuff, but they're ordering catalog parts that are made out of Pakistan or Mexico or Italy, and they ship them over. They weld them together, and they say blacksmithing. Wow, I didn't even know there was that sort of stuff out there. So it's a little bit misleading. So that's that's the competition that we have to to constantly um, clarify about 
how are we different than a fabrication shop? We're not ordering mass-produced pieces and welding them on square bar and making a railing. We're actually manipulating that square bar into that custom shape that that client wants and doing it by the power hammer and doing it by the anvil. So there is a little gray area where some some trades will will stretch their definition a little bit to be a little bit more appealing to get into that that bracket of clientele that they're wanting to get. Mm -hmm. But I think always that that, uh, you know, there's always going to be that clientele that wants that sweat and energy actually put into. Exactly. They want what they paid for because they're paying some decent money for that product. And we we're standing behind our product saying we're going to make it worth it. Don't you worry. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool, man. Well, it sounds really, really awesome, you know, and maybe I'm going to have to take a blacksmithing course here <laughs> <laughs> or get one of my friends to do it. And then I'll just leech off of them or something. like there that. There you go. But, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for taking the time to sit down and, uh, you know, out of your busy, busy day. Oh, know, no problem. But, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, uh, kind of throw out to anybody that's, that's looking to learn or is interested in this? Um, I had written notes down on the questionnaire you gave me getting oh, ready wow. for this. So <laughs> I think we covered all your questions. People that are interested in the blacksmithing. Um, one trend I noticed because of dirty doing dirty Smith and doing the tutorials. And I'm, I'm actually like, these are free tutorials I'm producing. It doesn't cost anything to watch me forge. And also, I respond back to comments that people have and questions on any any social media platform that I'm at. And the common issue that comes up is people not having patience. Mm -hmm. and, and a quote I've have, I have always think about is, is don't compare your chapter one to somebody's chapter 15. And have patience with yourself and, and have that positive attitude of that, I'm going to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, okay, I, I tried to forge this S hook. It didn't work out. I'm going to try it again. Oh, look, I did it. I did it well. Now I'm going to try to do it faster. Now I'm going to try to make it more efficient. And that's, and that's when you start building those foundation skills and those, those other skills. We get guys who want to make swords. Whoa, swords are a whole other thing. How about we just forge a taper? Let's just start out small <laughs> and get some basics down before we start Let, forging. Let's, let's do a poker. <laughs> yeah, do a poker, get some sausages on the grill and take our time with that. And that, that's the big thing is just have some patience because like any art, any craft, there's going to be people who take to it faster. There's going to be people who need a little bit more time and the wide range of uh, art styles and approach and technique. You can do anything you want inside of that and be okay with change and be okay with critiques and be okay with asking for help. There's mm -hmm. plenty of smiths. There's plenty of shops. If someone says, I'm trying to do this, what do you think? They can give their two cents and, and help you in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then 15 years down the road, they're going to look back and then they're going to, they're really going to actually appreciate the amount of time they put into it. Exactly. And a, a lot of guys are focusing on getting to that, that high end clientele because, you know, that's where the money is and stuff, but we're missing the big picture of that journey of getting in there because you're going to have all these stories and all these experiences and all these people that you met and all these things that you made that you can't get anywhere else unless mm -hmm. you get on that road to blacksmithing. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you very much for sitting down and talking with me here. I hope this uh, helps any of you guys that are listening out there that are thinking about becoming a blacksmith. And uh, like uh, Mr. Dirty Smith was saying here, <laughs> he does respond to any questions. So if any of you guys do have any questions about the trade, profession, techniques, classes, hit you guys up, right? Hit you hit you up. Hit me up. Email me. Talk on the forum, Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr. I mean, pick your flavor. And then what other next social media platform is coming up? I'm already eyeballing it to throw my stuff in there because I want you guys to see me because this is what I do. This is my job. Okay. Well, thanks again, and uh, have a good night, okay? All right. Thank you. So if you like what you heard, guys, please go like, subscribe. Uh, we're posting all these episodes on SoundCloud, on iTunes, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Uh, 
And also, if you like what you heard today, go on to collegealternative.net. There we've got all the episodes for you to choose from, constantly posting more. And stay tuned for next week, okay? Later, guys.